Welcome to the Vision for Life podcast, an ongoing conversation between the pastors of Fellowship Denver and the church at large. Each week we talk about life, faith, the Bible, and how to follow Jesus as we go about our daily lives. I'm Autumn, host of the podcast, and Dave, one of my friends and one of our pastors here at Fellowship Denver, is joining me on the podcast today. Dave, thanks for being with me. Thanks for having me on the show. Excited for today. Yes. Today, we've entitled our episode, Male and Female Bodies Are a Gift. And you can tell just from the title that we're stepping into an area of uh, truth and reality and interpretations of biology and meaning that are really hotly contested in culture right now. So Dave, first of all, thanks for agreeing to join me in this discussion. Happy to be here. And it's critical to talk about it. And yeah. it's a, a topic that everyone is having to process. And I think it's important for us to be able to sort of stumble forward, mm -hmm. seeking clarity from scripture, and also being gracious to people from various perspectives at the same time. So I'm excited to, uh, to have this conversation and mm -hmm. hopefully to provide some pathways for folks. And how is it that you talk about maleness, femaleness, um, transgenderism in a way that reflects truth, mm -hmm. love, and also clarity? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very apt way to put it, stumbling forward. That is a bit, honestly, of, of what it feels like, even to engage in these conversations. And you and I have given this a bit of thought and done some reading and discussed the topic from various perspectives, the way it is currently impacting the lives of kids in school, the way that this is present in our local context and conversations, related to education in particular, because that's something of interest to both of us as both of our kids are in, you have three kids in public school. I have three kids in public school. And so we've been discussing this, this issue for some time from different perspectives, but we haven't ever formulated it into the type of discussion that we're going to have on the podcast today. And so we want to invite our listeners into thinking deeply about this with us and learning alongside us, that's the posture we want to take, is that we continue to return to scripture to learn, but also to listen really thoughtfully to the ongoing conversations, even listen carefully to people with whom we disagree so that we can return to truth and compare uh, what we're hearing with scripture and then remain rooted in that. And all of it is in an effort actually to remain loving, to love people really well. That's right. I was talking to a friend right before this podcast who's a master's student, and she mentioned she's a counseling master's student, and she mentioned a professor of hers who now teaches gender at this um, seminary. And it used to be that gender was one quarter of one lecture that she used to teach. Now, in the past year, the demand is such that she teaches two different classes just on gender. And, and I think that's an interesting sort of reflection of where we, we're at right now in terms of the, the speed in which this discussion of what gender is, how we construct gender, and its relation with biological sex and all that. Like, the, the discussion on a popular level has become so... Um, ubiquitous that um, if you're you at home feel kind of caught off guard by it or not quite sure how to talk about it in a way that reflects the truth of scripture but also is loving then you're not alone like I think it's it's okay again that metaphor of stumbling forward I, I feel like that's that's a, a humble and an honest sort of description of, of what we're trying to do here hmm. yeah as we get into our conversation today and then into a, this next series of podcast episodes, they're not all going to focus specifically on the topic of gender, but all of them are attached in some way to this discussion, to being male and female 
to notions about God, to asking how do men and women exist together in the church? How do we care for each other well and work together well? So these next several episodes are all going to sort of be either about the topic of gender or adjacent to it, <laughs> intersect with it in some way. So before we get into this set of conversations, I want to say clearly that we do see scripture does teach us that people are unique among God's creation, that every person bears the image of God, and therefore that every person possesses dignity because of being made in the image of God. So in engaging in these conversations, our hope is not to estrange anyone or to cause more confusion. Actually, the opposite. It is to bring clarity to help us think through this and process. And yet we know in doing so, in even opening up this topic, that it inevitably raises questions and hurt and that there will be people who disagree with us. So we invite that. We invite your questions and comments, your disagreement. You can let us know what you're thinking and processing. And we want to say that regardless of what perspective someone holds or ideological position they take, that we still see each person as being valuable and possessing dignity. All right, so let's turn then to our topic today, male and female bodies are a gift. Even just in that title, we're indicating that we think scripture tells us something about this, that God created male and female. So first, we're just going to ask Dave, I'm going to ask, I am saying we're going to ask, but really I'm going to ask you, um, what is a biblical understanding of biological sex? I'm going to use that term right now because the term gender is convoluted. And in the current gender theory conversation, gender is divorced from or separate from, pulled apart from biological sex. So what is our, if we turn to the Bible, what does scripture teach us about being male and female? Well, you don't have to search far in Scripture. Right at the very beginning of Genesis, the first book of the Bible that has the creation account, um, we see in chapter 1 that God makes humanity, and he makes them in his image. And because of that, it reinforces what you just said about everyone has innate dignity being made in God's image. And it says that God made man in his own image, male and female, he created them. So from the beginning, this is Genesis 1, he creates them as two distinct sexed beings, male and female. Now, Genesis 2 gives a little bit more detail in some of the order of the creation of the man and of the woman. We see that Adam, uh, the Adam, is made first an earthling, and God says it's not good for him to live in isolation. There's actually no one else on the planet who is quite like Adam, and and God says it's not good for him to be alone. And then He says, "I will make a, a helper suitable for him." And um, the term "helper," uh, try not to be triggered by that. It's actually a a title of, of honor and dignity that we see used of God himself throughout scripture. So, um, but he says, I'm going to make a helper suitable for him. And then he has all of these, it's, it's this sort of almost humorous episode where he has all these animals before uh, Adam and Adam names the animals. And yet after that process, it says there still was not a helper suitable for him. And kind of through that, Adam realizes I am alone. There is no one like me here. Um, and Adam realizes what God had realized from the beginning. It took Adam a second to, to come up, get caught to speed. He realizes he is alone. And then that's where we have that famous story of Adam being, uh, God puts Adam to sleep and then takes his rib. And then out of his rib, out of the side of Adam, um, God breathes life into this second being. And Adam says, she shall be called woman, for she was made out of man. This is that last bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And it's this beautiful depiction of both 
are the same. They're made of the same stuff, both made clearly in God's image, and yet also clearly distinct. The very end of chapter two, it says that they were both naked and unashamed. And right before that, it says, and two shall become one flesh. So in their nakedness, the nakedness reference in chapter two refers literally to the sexual difference between Adam and Eve. And so God, who makes order out of chaos, Genesis 1, and then when he creates distinction, Adam, Eve, male, female, he actually makes it for the purpose of them using that their difference for the sake of each other. Two shall become one. And there is no oneness without the sexual distinction between Adam and Eve. Um, and they were naked and unashamed. So that's kind of how it, how it ends. And so I, I think in terms of understanding the biblical sort of framework and meaning of biological sex, it's sort of rooted right there in Genesis 2, that Adam and Eve are, are made for each other. They're both independent and separately fully reflect the image of God. So um, Adam didn't need Eve to be fully human. Eve doesn't need Adam to be fully human and made in God's image. And yet in their distinction, in their difference, they're oriented towards each other biologically in a way that they can experience a communion, a union that reflects profound meaning and purpose for why God created humanity. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Dave. That aspect of the humans being naked and unashamed, always in those first couple of chapters in the reading of Genesis, seems beautiful and integral to the story. And yet in the way that we often, I think, hear it presented or read it, that aspect of it can be confusing. But in understanding that God deliberately created them distinct, like different, that they actually bore that difference in their bodies for the purpose of unity and oneness that he divided to bring about equilibrium and the potential for unity is really beautiful in the story and tells us something essential about being man and woman, that that difference is meaningful that's right. And most of us, when we think of our bodies, um, we sort of inherit kind of this Greek dualistic understanding of spirit is one thing, body is another. And so many of us, which this is a part of the conversation we're going to have, are, are kind of disintegrated from uh, with our a deep understanding of our own bodies. We, we think our spirit's one thing, or who we are is one thing, and our body is something else. And But in Hebrew, and certainly the Hebraic understanding of the body that we get in Genesis 2, when it said that Adam and Eve were naked, that their, their bodies actually and their nakedness actually was a representation of, of a profound sense of actually who they were. And so in that sense, they were their body. There was no dualism in the sense that many of us sort of have inherited kind of that division. They were integrated whole beings, embodied beings. And so in order then now to be naked and unashamed was to be exposed in their essence of who they were with each other. Mm -hmm. So that aspect of being embodied persons was an essential part of their personhood. That's then. right. That's right. Which mm -hmm. like in the Old Testament, like when you died and your body went into the ground, they would say you were collected to your fathers. <laughs> like, in other words, you were put in the ground right next to your father. So the the division of soul and body, um, as we understood it, and now as sort of when we look into the New Testament, and of course, when we die now, we know that our soul actually is with God in heaven, and and our body is in the ground. But that's a temporary state. That's not a forever state. Actually, Christianity. Jesus reinforces this holistic understanding of the boss of the body that we are actually unified ultimately 
when resurrected with our resurrected bodies, and this is part of like the eternal kingdom. And so um, I think it's easy for us to get caught up into the bowl, soul body divide. And that's not really how personhood is really described in scripture. Hmm. That becomes very necessary in this conversation, that aspect of integration as seeing the person as both body and soul or body and spirit united Mm -hmm. is important. We'll talk about that more in our conversation today, but remember that, just tuck that away, that the Hebrew perspective and then the Christian perspective, the Judeo-Christian perspective about a person on a person and what it means to be a person always holds those together or should scripturally always hold those together, body and spirit or body and soul as an integrated whole. That's right. There's one other aspect of the description that you gave for us a moment ago, Dave, from Genesis 2, in which God divides the one human being into two, that he makes woman out of man. And then we see man and woman existing together as equals suited for each other. And that is this, then in the creation mandate in which God blesses them and commissions them to be his representatives, to act as kings and priests on his behalf, to rule alongside him. He tells them specifically to fill the earth and to multiply. And we talk often, or I think often maybe about the fact that God invited Adam and Eve into those acts of creation with him, Mm -hmm. there's one very special certain act of creation, and that is the potential to bring about more life that he gave to them, but neither of them could fulfill that without the other. So the actual potential to bring about more human life existed only through the union of the man and the woman. And that isn't to signify, as you said earlier, that either are less than complete if they are by themselves. So the man and the woman both fully image God, both are whole persons. And yet this specific act of creation into which God invites them that represents his own act of bringing about life can only be participated in if they do it together. That's right. And that's a key way that God chooses um, and sort of blesses humanity to continue on the acts of creation is through bringing life. We call it procreation, right? So it's a continue on of, of, of the creation process. And that, that we were given that gift is really a remarkable thing to, to think about. Um, you know, both of us have kids and, and it's amazing that God allowed us to help bring about human beings who wouldn't exist with, without us and to continue on in that creation process. It's really sort of a remarkable thing that we just sort of take it for granted. But if you really think about it, it's amazing. It is amazing. And I think that its function as metaphor is equally amazing Mm. in that the way in which people come to be a part of God's family is also depicted through that metaphor in what Jesus calls spiritual offspring. And then what the epistles talk about as the way in which people become a part of God's family. So those biological realities then act as metaphor and symbol for us in the new Testament and in our life together in the church. They don't function necessarily in the same way, but that is to say, Hunter is often mentioned on the podcast, that everyone then is invited into this relational aspect of being spiritual mothers and fathers within the context of the church, that we can relate to each other as brothers and sisters, and that anyone, whether you have children or not, are married or not, has the ability to understand the significance of being able to participate in this procreative act in a spiritual sense within the context of the church. That's right. We're all born. We get to also see people get born again. We're all a product of creation, and we get to see new creation. It's amazing. Mm-hmm.
Let's return for a moment, Dave, to something you mentioned already, and that is this understanding of the body, the theology of the body. You introduced this idea a moment ago and explained that Greek view of the body that we've actually inherited quite a bit of is this dualistic idea that spirit or soul, perhaps you could use those interchangeably, some people define them differently, some people use them interchangeably, but this sort of immaterial substance is what is actually you. And your body is something that is made of matter, is of nature, and therefore is lower, lower in its actual ability to represent the truth of who someone is, and lower in that it is always corruptible. It is subject to decay. Those were Greek ideas, but that is not the idea that we see given to us in scripture. So could you explain that a bit more? Sure. And it, I think it's easy to get locked into this sort of dualistic understanding of the body because our bodies are um, often failing and they are dying, you know? And so for, for many of us, you know, I think of the old hymn, you know, I'll fly away, old dear Lordy, I'll fly <laughs> away. Like, the the eschatological hope is to be freed from the from the body, and so it, I think it's it's really understandable why many of us sort of have have that within the church, not just as a sort of influence of Greco Roman ideology, but with but within within the church. I, I I get it if that's what people sort of think, and yet um, the idea that our bodies are just our earth suits and someday we will be uh, uh, emancipated from from our our bodies and our souls in their pure essence can ascend uh, to heaven and exist forever that that isn't Christian like that's not a, a biblical concept if you understand that as in itself like our our ultimate hope rather, it is clear that the biblical understanding of the body is a spirit body unified whole. And we know this because Jesus, who, where our understanding of God, our understanding of what's true and what's ultimate comes ultimately from, from Jesus for those who follow him. And when he rose from the dead, he rose physically from the dead. And it's clear that he made it evidently, like, like super clear to his disciples that he was a physical person. Now he had a new kind of physicality, of course, but he, he was no less physical. He was almost more real, almost more physical, not less. He wasn't shadowy. He was actually more, uh, present and this kind of physicality could no longer die. Um, and yet it could transcend other kind of limitations that our bodies currently have on this side of the resurrection. And, but because he did raise from the dead and he showed that to his disciples, that reality then becomes sort of our interpretive grid, if you will, of how we understand our hope. Our hope isn't to be separate from the body. Our hope is actually to be unified with our body, a restored, resurrected body. It's the hope for the entire world, not a world that is obliterated and that there's some sort of floating spiritual reality, but a renewed physical world, a, a washed, purified world that's really physical and that's a unified whole. So the resurrection of Jesus gives us our picture of hope individually, but also how we should understand a, a unified, integrated whole for actually all of creation. Mm -hmm. We participate in a sacrament or an ordinance, you could call it either, every week at Fellowship that reminds us of the necessity of Jesus' physical body. And that is the Lord's Supper or communion. Every week as we partake of communion, we remember that Jesus shed his blood and gave his body on our behalf, that his body was broken, his blood was shed, that his physical self, his participation in matter, in our earthly 
physical world was significant because that was a part of what he was able to give on our behalf. It's important that we return to that idea, that scriptural understanding of the body and integration of a person as body and soul, because current gender theory relies on fragmenting so many aspects of the person. So Dave, some of the ways in which even we've reflected this in our hopefully thoughtful use of language are a result of that fragmentation, that pulling apart. So in the context in which these conversations are currently being had, the, there's a fragmentation not only of body and soul, which we already talked about, but of sex and gender, which is why we even pointed out that we're going to veer off and away from using the word gender in this conversation and use the word sex to indicate biological sex, because the understanding of those two has been pulled apart. What other ways do you see that happening, like that fragmentation occurring in, in the context of current gender theory conversations? Um, in a book that we've read, um, an excellent book, a great book called the Genesis of gender by Abigail Faval. <laughs> um, she does a great job of, of showing sort of the, the main tension in this discussion is the tension between essence and existentialism or existence. And the question is, uh, is there anything that is truly objective or essential in our bodies that tells us something about who we are at a more deeper, profound sense or not? Or is our, our body just an expression or an experience of something that is secondary to our essence that exists somewhere else, namely in sort of a, a social kind of construct that is outside of our bodies. So this idea of essence versus experience or existentialism is really Im important in this discussion. And uh, Faval says that our body is an essence, meaning it has an irreducible component of our personality, of who we are in terms of our being, male, our being female, that it actually tells us something essential about who you are and your being. And this is in contrast to the perspective that says that your being, who you really are, is actually just performative. Um, and, and so uh, she highlights this statement that for me was really helpful. And she kind of called the statement a sort of the seed of that would become gender theory, which is um, one is not born a woman, one becomes a woman. And that was a quote from an, an early, um, uh, I think it was a feminist theory um, mm -hmm. uh, leader and scholar in the, I think, 60s. But the idea that... Um, where how you are born, um, your gendered reality when you are born, is is secondary to what it is you feel you might become later in your life, and so uh, the divorce between your given state of your body and your being and who you are, sort of in an ultimate sense. The divorce between those two, the division between that two, as she highlights, is really a, a fracturing of the human experience and to separate someone from their embodied reality. And there's all kinds of, of problems that stem from that. But for, I think, the sake of our conversation, it, it's also highlighting a, a difference between that and what we see in, in Genesis, where God clearly creates us as an embodied whole, whole people and that our bodies actually have meaning and purpose. They tell us something about who we are in, in a really important way. Yes, that quote that you mentioned, one is not born but becomes a woman, 
is in, I believe it was, it's a, a book by Simone de Beauvoir, who was a French feminist. And I think she was actively writing, as you mentioned, Dave, in the 1960s. And that quote was from her book called The Second Sex. And it did act as based on the book that we read in which Dr. Abigail Faval explains the different waves of feminism and the philosophies that propelled the various waves of feminism forward. As she unpacks that in her book, she explains that that acts as the seed that is one of the driving forces that makes gender malleable, that acts as the seed for what we are experiencing now in the current cultural conversations about gender, that it arises from these theories that were initially considered and written about by feminists, by feminist scholars. Dr. Faval can speak to this because she herself holds a PhD in gender studies and feminist literary criticism. So she has an interesting story. But it allows her in this book to speak very clearly to these theories that influenced both early feminist thought and theory and that are a heavy influence in current the current conversations around gender theory. And one interesting thing that she points out as you began to explain there, Dave, is a further fragmentation that impacts women very specifically. So we talked about some of these dichotomies, some of the ways in which what is meant to be an integrated whole in the current cultural context and in current gender conver conversations are being pulled apart. And we talked about body and soul, sex and gender. For women in particular, some of that fragmentation is a woman and her particular ability to carry life. So a woman's fertility in particular, becomes fragmented. So a woman's fertility is not a part of her essence. What she carries in her body is not part of her essential self. It has to be something that is other. So the idea of what the existence of a woman is, is fragmented from her fertility. And Dr. Faval mentions specifically that this has been impactful, particularly for women, because in a world impacted by these feminist theories and now by these gender theories, the actual effect for women is that aspects of their physical selves and their physical reality have to be subjugated or controlled in order to participate in an equal way in the greater societal norms. That's right. And so in order to gain freedom in society, then the only hope for a woman is to actually negate the, she would say, negate the reality of her body and the abilities of her physicality. And so her capacity for reproduction is now pathologized. And um, so it's no longer a part of who she is, but it's actually uh, become sort of medicalized in such a way that that separates that capacity from her essence or from her her embodied reality. And and she makes the point, and again, as as someone who taught gender theory for years, it's really fascinating. She she makes the point over and over again throughout the book that in an this is all done in an, in an effort to gain um freedom, to gain representation under the law and 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 thank goodness for it. Like there's especially she highlights first wave feminism, like um, society is better and there's more protections because of the work of, of many of these movements. Mm -hmm. And we um, agree. Yeah. We agree with that. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, but but uh, one of the, the byproducts of this sort of not intentional, but it's it's really happened is that it's actually fallen into this historic trope that in order for a woman to be fully equal, she actually has to just become like a man. And, and the effort, actually, of divorcing um, reproductive abilities from the woman 
actually is just sort of falling into this sort of historic trope that in order to be fully equal, you actually have to erase the realities of your body as a woman. And, and so it therefore elevating, uh, one sex over the other in a way that wasn't intended by the feminist, but in fact, that's, that's what's happened. And, and really what she's sort of inviting us to explore is, is, um, especially for women integrating their bodily reality into understanding sort of their essence, um, actually is a way to experience, um, wholeness and health in a more Mm -hmm. spiritually meaningful way than maybe what a lot of, especially women are sort of given today as sort of options for how they think about their bodies. It is a very revelatory question to ask whether or not equality for women is even something that is attainable by, by way of simply striving for more masculinely derived societal norms. And that is what she argues is happening through the attempt to actually elevate women. But in that attempt, what is required of them, as you mentioned, Dave, is that they subjugate their bodies. And she's saying because we are integrated selves, which we agree with, because we're integrated wholes, that this is an aspect of being female that is actually unable to be fully severed from being female. That's right. Mm -hmm. Um, Another uh, fracturing or division that's related to this is the division between sex and babies itself. And she um, references the, the classic dystopian novel, Brave New World, um, which I remember reading years ago, and and there were these little baby factories, and these couples, you know, could pick out their babies from these designer babies from the baby factory, and and, and it was sort of a, a commentary on is do we want to actually separate? Like, is it better? Are we better a society if we begin to separate the act of sex from its intended? result and its potentiality to create new life. Um, and do we want to live in such a way and create a society to where that's normative to separate those things? And, um, of course she's, she sees a lot of problems with that as someone who had taught that theory for years and had seen sort of the negative byproducts of it. She's like, no, we should actually reinforce the, the, the connection between, a woman and her ability to have children and then sex and the capacity to create new life. And the more we bring those together, the more actually we'll find a a greater sense of joy and embodiment. Hmm. It's interesting that in the trajectory of these theories and the effects that we can see, the effects that we can observe now and trace back to their I don't know if I want to say origin point because everything has an idea that is similar that predated it. But we can see the clear link to particularly certain of these feminist theories that impacted current individuals who are very influential, Judith Butler being one of them, in the way in which the conversation is being had about gender now. It's interesting that it relies on fragmentation and in the fragmentation of woman in particular in the division as you mentioned Dave of the act of sex and the creation of a baby or the division of woman and her ability to carry to generate a certain sort of life in her womb to carry a human baby in her womb when those are fragmented and the idea of woman becomes just that when it enters the realm, not of the physical, but of the existential and is made malleable, then what woman becomes is an image, a certain adaptation to something that is actually 
socially constructed. And this attaches the idea of performance that you mentioned before, that gender is performative. And that, in turn, reinforces some stereotypes or categories that much of gender theory actually dislikes and seeks to get rid of. And yet, at just a common level, in the ways that these adaptations settle into culture, what is reinforced is that a woman looks a certain way and that a man looks a certain way and that if you project that image that you therefore can embody one or the other in some ways this is the interesting part that in itself is more limiting or constricting than the presentation that we see in the bible in the bible we have all sorts of pictures of men and women who had different characteristics, who did different things, who accomplished different things, who were called to different things. And these categories of the ways in which male and female persons, what I'm calling men and women, can exist and can impact many people around them is really broad in scripture. It's not limited to the way a person appears or to these sorts of constricted categories. And yet that's kind of what the nature of the conversation tells us is that anything old must therefore be traditional and therefore constricting. It's fascinating. In the book, she talks about, she actually min, uh, laments the, um, the loss of what she calls a butch woman. And she talks throughout the book about sort of her having like, legs that are like a man and being more hairy <laughs> than like what she always felt was culturally appropriate for a woman. Yes. And, and, but she, she talks about kind of the loss of the butch woman in particular, um, because with the, the whole trans movement, um, they're no longer women. And she says, what's sort of a, what's, what's lost in this lament she has is that there, there was actually an experience of womanhood that that maybe had some masculine, classic kind of masculine characteristics, but were still nevertheless women and would understand, like it was rooted in understanding of their embodied reality, even though their embodied reality as a woman maybe um, went against cultural stereotypes, but it was still firmly a woman. And, and she's like, with the loss, like we lose something as society her point she's making when when we don't when women and men aren't able to maintain their their embodied reality as women and men and yet have it be expressed in ways that do sort of uh, stretch our understanding of what a woman or a man ought to look like hmm. Dr. Faval also points out that the way in which these all of these categories are constructed is through language and through a specific understanding of language, through a postmodern understanding of and use of language. Can you unpack that? <laughs> sure. For us a little Just bit, a Dave? real quick uh, Just, definition uh, of postmodernity here. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the two major philosophers kind of behind postmodernity, um, Foucault, Derrida, both of them uh, sort of together created a philosophical movement that, that goes something along the lines of um, there is no, there's nothing that's original. Like the idea of like truth or objective reality, basically they just denied the existence of that. But there are only copies. So if you think even of like Plato's sort of book on the cave, that there's like the essence and then most of us sort of live in a cave and we sort of play off of the shadows. But there's this idea that there is a real thing that's out there. We're just don't always have access to the real thing. Foucault said there is no real. There are only copies. And so then if that's true, then the only way for meaning to be created is just through the use of language in constructing our own meaning with the language and terminologies that we are inherited, and then to adjusting it and changing it in a way to create reality that matches what it is we think we want. 
So it's a denial of existence of objective truth and creating then a kind of reality that is purely constructed by language. And now gender theory um, relies really heavily on this ideology then and says that therefore biological sex isn't a real thing. There's no objective reality to it. It is itself something that is totally, that is constructed. Therefore, we have to change our language in a way to create the reality that we want. And this is helpful to know, like, why the pronoun debate is so um, important and why our, our our kids are, are sort of in schools, mine are in schools where they're having to choose and and have pronouns, you know, or that wasn't the case even two years ago. And sort of what's, what's sort of behind all of this? Well, part of what's behind it and why it's so such a powerful ideological sort of movement is it's this idea that if you're able to speak and to create language around a kind of reality that one might want it makes it real like that's the only real thing you have and and then if you don't participate in it then you're not just sort of you know protesting some political movement you're actually denying someone their existence you're denying someone the their essence because real meaning is a constructed thing and if you don't play along with it and use that language then you're taking something out of away from them. And so it's a real, it's a very incredibly powerful concept ideology that is now popularized. What's fascinating, she uses the language of trickle down academia. Now I, many of us studied uh, Foucault and Derrida in college. And uh, I had all kinds of of theories, um, critical theory in college. Most, most people go through college, study these people, and understand their the the theory sort of in the context of either literary theory or, or or whatever, but but now she sort of highlights and we're all kind of seeing that this theory now is sort of out of academia now it's trickled down ap- academia into sort of broader cultural political realities um, that are changing the way that we do language today and how it is people see reality. Hmm. One real-time example that she uses in the book is exactly what we're talking about, about this division of the ideas of sex and gender. And she points out that the idea of gender as it exists in our current conversations was not even an idea itself that existed in a way that was represented in language until we began to see the impact of those theories that you just mentioned, Dave. So she states it like this. What is the difference? Are sex and gender interchangeable synonyms? Do they reflect a Gnostic split between body, sex, and soul, gender? Do they signify the interplay between biology and society in human identity? Depending upon the context, the word sex and gender can evoke any and all of those meanings. Why? Because in a nutshell, we are deeply confused about what it means to be a body. We no longer know who we are as sexed beings, and this is mirrored in our language. But it even goes beyond that to constructing then that reality and imposing through the language used a certain new normative understanding that you buy into by using that language then. Which then puts people in a situation. Do we use the language that's given to us? And if we don't use it, there are real social consequences to it. Sometimes it's just a slap on the wrist, but sometimes it might be something more significant and something where the the cost is potentially life-changing. And you're always, at least from my perspective, wrestling with the cost as seen expressed in the life of someone who has imbibed these current social and moral philosophies. So if you don't use that, then someone can experience hurt within the context of this conversation and their understanding of all of these concepts. Because if your understanding of reality is 
that which is simply created via language around you. Then if people don't participate using that language, then what's really real for you breaks down and it's a threat to your life. It feels incredibly um, hurtful and it's almost impossible to maintain a meaningful relationship with someone who can't participate in that. Mm. Faval, Dr. Faval highlights that this is something that postmodernity actually gets right. Language is powerful, and the language that we use, the words and terms that we use, do project a certain understanding and do imply a greater meaning. That's right. She uh, she does make that incredible point that um, when you do use words in certain ways, it does shape our experience of reality. Now, she's careful to say, and of course we would agree with her, that um, there is a limit to that. She says, mm-hmm. if you try to create reality, eventually reality <laughs> pushes back. If you push the edge of reality, eventually... It breaks back in. <laughs> it breaks it breaks back in if you like it or not. And that was a, a helpful kind of a re- reminder. She, she also highlights that Adam and Eve... Um, something fascinating I hadn't really thought of before that um, Adam was given the responsibility to name the animals and in naming the animals it was really quite the responsibility there's something really powerful about that Adam didn't create the animals God did God's the creator he creates the essence but There is something powerful and reflective about who God is by his ability, by Adam's ability to name name the animals. And so in in a like manner, um, our language is really powerful and it is important. And if we simply sort of go along with language as it's given to us, it might have real significant... um, consequences and and change the way that we think reality is but it doesn't have the ultimate power to change reality Mm -hmm. to change the essence of a thing that's what god does Mm -hmm. yeah this is a distinct difference between god and people god by his word created and God gave us the gift of language. And so God, by his word, bestows meaning. And humans, via the gift of language, interpret meaning. That is the intended order that we see in Genesis. And that's actually where you can find purpose and joy for people who are so, many of us are so longing for finding meaning and purpose in our own bodies and in our own lives there's something about um, accepting the givenness of our created existence as God made us and saying it is good. Mm. I think the way that Dr. Faval encapsulates this is also a good place to end this conversation. She uses the word, the body is a gift. That is a quote from the book, but obviously other people have made this observation (laughs) too. The body is a gift, that there's a givenness to our bodies and that God bestowed meaning on beings who were made male and female, who were made different, but who could in their difference display oneness and unity. And she has this quote that we will conclude with today. And it says, the body is a gift. That is the Christian view. Embodiment binds us to all other life, all other matter. Think of the intimacy of taking a breath, drawing the exhalation of other organisms into your lungs, borrowing a bit of their life to sustain yours. Think of the intimacy of eating, welcoming the matter of plants and animals, absorbing it into your flesh, drawing strength and energy from the fruit of the earth. Think of the intimacy of walking, trusting in each moment that the ground will hold you up, a trust so implicit it remains unthought. It is not the idealized body that is a gift, the body adorned with ornamental muscle, the body with long limbs and smooth skin, the airbrushed body suspended in the amber of perpetual health and conventional beauty. We find the body's giftedness within its finitude, its limits and flaws, because the These limits 
And I'm going to add here parentheses because these limits, including being limited to a gendered body, including being male and female, reveal to us our interdependence and awaken us to our ultimate vocation to give and receive love. Our bodies are not aesthetic objects. They are modes of belonging. Well, Dave, thank you for having this conversation with me on the podcast today. We would love to hear your feedback, your questions, and your suggestions. You can send all of that anytime to podcast at fellowshipdenver.org. Thanks for joining us on the Vision for Life podcast. Special thanks to Adam England for our theme music, to Jesse Cowan, our producer, and to Judd Connell, who provides transcription for these episodes. 